so right then I had this great epiphany. I need to be a driver coach. I need to engineer the driver because duh, was I paying attention in school? It's a system. I need to not build a better sword. I need to build a better swordsman. Welcome to the Your Data Driven Podcast. If you like this podcast, be sure to visit our website at yourdatadriven.com for more useful help and advice on setting up your race car, mastering data analysis, and driving faster. Welcome to episode 33. Today I'm talking with John Block, a legendary motorsports engineer who's worked at the highest levels in North American racing, engineering pole winning cars at the Indy 500 as well as in NASCAR. Through this story of John's background, you can begin to understand how the role of the scientific method can help your own driving and success on track. From an age before data to now one where we're spoilt with the numbers, it's a fascinating conversation I really hope you enjoy. One of John's tips for drivers is he who can get back on the throttle soonest is the winner. But why? What does he really mean by that? So, as ever, sit back, grab a coffee, and let's hear what John has to say. Welcome, John. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to have you here. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say and for this conversation you have done. Uh, well, as we'll, I'm sure we'll find out in a minute, he does so much in motorsport in terms of uh, the engineering and driving and, and also a bit of fabricating as well, which we could talk about it in a little bit. But, you know, so today's goal really is to get one or two takeaways for people listening to see, well, you know, I can take those that idea or I can take that method or process back to my own racing or my own motorsports or my own track day activity and try and put that into action. And it could be something around engineering or something to do about with the drivers you worked with, just something to help people out. And that would be, how does that sound for, for a challenge? Oh, that sounds great. Let's do it. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, first off, let's learn a little bit about you for the benefit of people listening. Who are you? What have you done? Because I think that you've started off doing a bit of racing yourself, haven't you? And then, and then it's evolved over the years. So... Tell us about you. I, th- I think the way you normally start this is, hi, my name is John. I'm a racer. <laughs> yes, I'm thoroughly addicted. Racing is more like a religion to me. It's something that I've been involved with my entire life. My dad raced. So, you know, my mom took me to the racetrack when I was still a baby and wow. grew up around the shop. And it's just natural that I'd end up here. However, my my dad did not want me to have anything to do with racing. So, oh, so why was that? Because he knew. Because he had a lot of friends that had been in racing, and in those days, in the late fifties and early sixties, it was a it was a very tough lifestyle. And they used to say, "You'll never even make enough money to buy tennis shoes." So, okay, whatever. <laughs> However, you know, he insisted that I was going to go to school and I was not going to race. Like I said, I showed him when I was sixteen. I lied about my age, bought a race car, and hit it at a friend's house. <laughs> now, he, he was a mechanic who worked at a dealership. I don't know uh, what a 16-year-old was thinking that his father wouldn't find out, but it, it took about uh, seven or eight days before you know somebody came into the phone and said, oh, I saw your kid at the racetrack. And he came home and says, you racing? It's like, me? Racing? Was I racing? It's like, well, okay, here we go. So anyway, that was... Uh, the beginnings of it all. Now, interestingly enough, since he did not want to have anything to do with me racing, he did nothing to help me. I was totally on my own. Hmm. So I had to figure out everything on my own. Now, fortunately, I had access to some resources. He was an avid reader, so he had every manual that the factory came out with. And so our garage was full of things. So I always could go out and read and try and figure out. And then being a, a shop rat worked as a janitor in shops you know i could always go around and ask all the guys what they were doing with their race car so it was you had to learn to survive and i started out as a racer but then quickly realized that i needed more resources since he insisted i was going to go to school i went to college and like suddenly oh so that's how i read the cheers oh so you start bringing in your education and just start building on it so that's ancient history what did you study what did you study at college actually i was a double major architecture and civil engineering 
the reason I was looking at architecture is in the late 60s and in the early 70s, Detroit was more interested in hiring architects to be designers than engineers. That's when they were all starting to try to look outside of the box. And architects were a little better at designing. They could, they could be a little more creative. Now, of course, I realized I had something to lean on. I needed the, the civil part too, because I was very interested in structures, strength of materials, all that sort of thing. You can get into force diagrams, whatever. I guess it's uh, taking that intuition though, that you will have been picking up through all that sort of practical experience and then trying to put that put some sort of maths and science towards it and almost reassure yourself that your intuition was right and then, then go to the next step of actually now I can do something more with this. Exactly. So it was more than just, why does it do this? It's like, how does it do this? And start building on that. I moved to California right after I graduated from the University of New Mexico and immediately got into uh, San Diego State University just as an unde undeclared graduate just so that I could keep taking more classes because suddenly something happened at that point in my life and the intellectual curiosity just blossomed. And I was a single guy and so it didn't matter that every evening after work, well, immediately I got a job in an engineering firm in California because I had to, I had to pay rent, <laughs> buy groceries. Um, but, you know, I'd go every evening until they closed the library studying the SAE transactions. It's like, wow, look at this information. I think um, the people listening that, but like half the people are going like, yeah, I totally get that. And other people are going like, what? And it's one of those things, when you get into it, it doesn't feel like uh, work, I suppose. It doesn't feel like, you know, if, you, if you find that you're, you take to these kind of, this kind of education and this kind of maths and it's it's, your curiosity is spiked as it will it, it doesn't i guess it didn't feel like a pain you wouldn't be forced to do it but you must have really enjoyed it it was just a the thirst to try and do more because the whole time i was in college i worked in a machine shop as a machinist and so i was developing a lot of parallel skills along the way and I was still working on friends race cars so i was never out of it and i was always in it every weekend so I didn't know that you weren't supposed to go to the racetrack on Saturday. All the other young fellows were going to the pubs and the bars, and I was at the racetrack. So it just evolved, and I just kept working on people's cars, and then finally got enough money saved up. I could open my own shop out in Santee, California, and was doing a little prep work for different people. I kept trying to get jobs up there, always knocking on the door at at all American racers, Bernie's like, you need a junior engineer, you need a junior engineer. They never could get in there and just started you know, collecting more material. I have a, a library, my personal library. I have well over 300 automotive books. I've got some pretty nice old rare ones. And then I was collecting books up until about five years ago. I don't think I've purchased a new book in the last five years, but I've got almost every book that's been printed. But it was just to help build that understanding. People here are probably familiar with role centers. Role centers are very popular. They've got extremely popular, oh, I'd say in the late 70s and early 80s. But it's funny how things have changed over time because before that, in the, say the early to middle 70s, all the race car engineers were very excited about the suspension frequencies. And everybody was talking about suspension frequencies. Well, that's faded away. And then roll centers became popular, and everybody is still locked in on roll centers. But I, I try and tell uh, as many people as I can, there's more to vehicle dynamics than just roll centers. <laughs> well, there, there are so many more parameters. When was the last time you ever heard somebody talk about static margin or elastic conjugate points or frequency? Once you understand it, and, and believe me, I have a... I know enough about this subject to know that I don't know everything. I certainly don't know what I'm talking about, really. Although I should, in a way. But there's things well, like, it's one of those things where you got to go through this curve of thinking, oh, well, I really don't know anything. And then you start to learn some stuff and you think, oh, actually, I actually feel quite confident. And then you dig a bit more into it and then you go, actually, I don't really. It's all. And actually, no, maybe no one does because it's, it's, it's so complex in terms of those interrelations. And what we're trying to do is simplify that back into something away from that intellectual exercise into something practical. So, okay, what can I actually do here that will make a difference? And uh, things like static margins is a really interesting one because that's from the sort of more of the air airplane world, isn't it? In terms of that stability of the vehicle. And 
when people are talking, you know, talk about understeer and oversteer and, and then with the stiffness at the front and the back, and it basically all resolves down to this static margin thing. And it's just like, once you understand that, it's much easier to think about it. But to get to it from where people are starting, I've just got these springs on my car and I, I don't really, how do I get from what I can see to this number that can be really useful? It's interesting because in my own personal journey is I went down that rabbit hole really deeply and the thing is having come from the car culture we're a group of tweakers we like to twist the wrench so the, the demon tweak is gonna win the race and we're very involved in the, the automobile but we forget that this is motor sports we tend to get very focused on the motor sports rather than motor sports and after a number of years climbing the ladder i always thought, oh, I'm such a good engineer. Look at what we did. We went faster because I'm such a good engineer. And um, well, climbing the ranks that way, back in 85, I landed a job with an IndyCar team. And as luck would have it, we got the pole at the Indy 500 that year. And I always thought, oh, I'm such a good engineer. I now realize I didn't have a clue what I was doing. It was luck. Granted, several things all aligned. I was doing things that I didn't realize I was doing. I didn't realize that I was employing the Hawthorne effect and the driver didn't realize it either. For the benefit of people listening. It's a very interesting thing. It's actually where psychology and engineering cross the road. It's taught in both psychology and in engineering when you start getting into statistical process control. This is it kind of goes back to the, the famous thing that Henry Ford said. Henry said, if a man believes he can't, or if a man believes he can, he's right. From the psychology side of it, it is if a test knows there's a test, the results will be different than if they, they don't know. That's why in medicine, we have the double-blind placebo. Um, I thought it was that, because because it was they did something in, in factories and stuff, didn't they, where if they had inspectors, the productivity was higher than if it wasn't, even though they were doing the same job. It was something, there was something like that, which is the Hawthorne effect, which is, yeah, okay. It was at the Hawthorne plant. It was back during the, the war, the first old people, the, the big war, and the men were all off at in the war fighting and the women were at the factory winding motors and the world was very different then. It was all about how can we be more productive? We were trying to win the war. And what they did was they had those engineering charges things. We took a group and separated them and said, okay, we're going to, we're going to do an experiment to see if we can do it to improve productivity. And they were like, yes, let's do it. But they separated the group in a different area and they raised the light level. Productivity went up. Yes, they raised the light level again. Productivity goes up again. Raise the product, raise the light level again. Productivity goes up again. Now, what do all good engineers do? You go back to the base. Went back to the baseline. Guess what? Productivity went up again. So, so you make you make a really good point there about about. I've got a, a question for you about testing, and that's something that I like. So, it's, it's quite normal in a professional environment to do this sort of ABA or A A or A B A B A whatever. Yeah, it depends on what you're doing. But the idea is you start off with a set of settings, and then you go out and do some stuff and. You try something, different things during the day, but then you get at the end of the day or at some point during the day or middle of the day or whatever, you go back to where you started from and just to double check that the gains that you've hopefully made during the day are real. Well, and also to see uh, what kind of drift there's been in the ambient conditions. It's interesting that there's so much psychology involved and that's probably, oh, about 10, 15 years ago, I got real excited about psychology and uh, started reading everything I could get my hands on, you know, all kinds of sports psychology books. And suddenly, the things really started clicking because there have been times when, like I said, back in my IndyCar days, we got the pull at the Indy 500. Now, granted, there were some clever things. I, back in those days, we didn't have data acquisition. And my version was I took some spent rods from the TIG welder and welded little washers on them and used springs out of ballpoint pens with the old click style ballpoint pen and back where the rocker arms were i took a little piece of steel maybe about an inch and a half wide maybe about half inch tall and used uh dicom blue for you machinists out there dicom blue is for layout and then i had it set up with my little thing so i used tiny little model airplane cables 
and hooked them to the washers on these tungsten and rods and ran it all the way back up to the cockpit and put a big washer on it and just hung it on a thing. And I told the driver, I said, when you get down, you know, about halfway down the straightaway, unhook the washer, go through one and two, and then hook it back. And then just, I'll look at it later. And the idea was, is pins, the tungsten and rods, hit the little plate with the backing on it. And then as the suspension moved, it scribed little arcs. So in essence, I had mechanical suspension sensors. And so that's how I was getting an idea of how much travel I was getting through the corners. And then from that, I thought, oh, okay. And my eyes were way better in those days. I could go stand down in the short chute and watch the cars come through. And I could see the pitch and the heave and, oh, okay, okay, okay. And then quickly figured out that I needed much, much stiffer on my springs. And we ended up double the spring rate of anybody else. Where everybody else was running a combination of 3,000 and 3,500 pound springs, we were running 6,000 and 6,500 pound springs. And that's because I looked at the travel and my eyes were good enough I could see the ground clearance um, because in those days, the uh, tunnels were very sensitive to pitch. The center of pressure would run back and forth a lot. And that's why back in those days, a lot of indie cars used to hit the wall in turn four because you'd go over the, the tunnel bump at the north end of the track and the thing wouldn't have settled down yet and the back would be a little low so the, the front would start to understeer and the driver would start putting in a little more wheel a little more wheel and then you'd get this slow rock and come back and the center pressure would run forward and, it, and the back end would snap and that's why they used to always spin into the wall and that i could see that standing i was like okay okay so i went real stiff which meant i could drop my ride heights which also meant that in turns one and three, when you lost a lot of speed, the car didn't lift as much. I kept my ground clearance lower. So you didn't have to lift for two and four. So it was the old things like, he who, he who can get back to the throttle first wins. And from an engineering standpoint, there's a lot of truth to that. But we now have data acquisition and it's a lot easier now because you can just pull up the data and look at it. And I like to use an expression from one of my buddies here, the money line, Peter Krause, he's got that expression. I like to use it. And that's your, that's just your velocity. Everybody can use this. It doesn't matter if you're a club racer, time attack or whatever kind of thing you're running in. I agree with you. Well, looking at this thing and it's, just, it's showing, oh, it's quicker here and slower here. I get that. It's a squiggly line. How can that tell me how I can improve my, my driving? Okay, the first response from the engineer is more area under the curve. So for you non-mathematical people, that means if you look at your speed trace and the area below the line is what you're trying to maximize. Because if you could imagine that you had a track and you just could hold a, a single speed all the way around the track, then it's really easy. You just take on that graph of the speed at your height and your length and you just multiply those two and you've got the area. Well, this is where calculus, sorry, I said the C word, sorry, but we want to try and maximize that area. So that's when I also got into. Just to, just to clarify, that's, that's your distance traveled, isn't it? So you would, yeah. you, you've got you, you've got a fixed distance notionally around your track. Let's forget in your different options on your corner line. So that's, you want to travel that distance as quickly as you can. And so you want to drive as fast as you can, but then unfortunately you have to slow down for the corners, don't you? So. Yeah, we call that speed correction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, through my career, I've had great luck and I've had some really bad experiences. Like I said, we were fortunate enough to get the pole at the Indy 500. Later years, I moved to stock cars and managed to get the pole at both Talladega and Daytona, which is a lot easier because there the driver never lifts. It's more like drag racing. You know, with a regular circuit, there's a balance. What percentage is driver? What percentage is car? Depending on your event, your class, if you're in a spec class, now suddenly the driver comes way further up the scale. Maybe the driver is 80%, 85%, 90% of the, the final result. Well, that's the nice thing about Daytona and Talladega. The driver is maybe maybe five, probably closer to two. <laughs> it's like you're holding it wide open. It's just don't hit the bumps. Don't hit the wall. I'll figure out the rest. I'll make it fast. But then there's been other times where I've had to do what we call the walk of shame. In NASCAR, in the older days, not so much now, but in the old days, there would be 50 teams show up, 55 teams, 60 teams show up. And if you didn't 
go fast enough in qualifying, you had to vacate the paddock before the end of the day. Oh, wow. So there wasn't enough space on the grid for everyone. Right. So it was called the walk of shame. And that's pretty embarrassing when you're supposed to be a professional. It's hard to get another job, too, because everybody watches you walk out. Now, there, there is a little tiny bit, and a few people will come and say, oh, I'm sorry, bro. We've been there. We know it hurts. But there have been times when uh, I first tried to break into NASCAR with a little team, and we went to the, the Brickyard 400. And during testing, we're fine. Everything's good. I've got all my data. It's like, fine. We're going to make the field. And then you come down to qualifying and, and suddenly you're out. It's like, what happened? It's like, why are we slower? You know, and the driver's blaming this and everybody's blaming that. And of course, all the fingers are pointing at the engineer. When I'm looking at the data and I just want to cry because I'm thinking, I'm never going to get a job again. It's like, how am I going to, how am I going to pay the mortgage? But fortunately with data, you can really start looking at it. And it's, oh, it wasn't me. The driver went in deeper, which meant he had to brake harder, which meant his minimum speed was lower and I have less area under the curve. So right then I had this great epiphany. I need to be a driver coach. I need to engineer the driver because duh, was not paying attention in school. It's a system. I need to not build a better sword. I need to build a better swordsman. So that's when I really got into the psychology and the coaching. And hopefully these days, the drivers I've been working with, they're having a little better luck because we break it down real easy. And here's you know, something that all drivers at all levels can use. Your goal is to try and get that speed trace as high as you can on the graph. All right, from an engineering standpoint, the positive slope, the one that goes up to the right, that's, you can point the finger at me. Well, I might point it back at you if you miss a shift. If we get more horsepower or we get less drag, my slope is gonna be steeper. Now, the other thing is that slope can move up or down and what we call the intercept, the y-axis. And it's real easy to do that. And that's your job, Mr. Driver. The sooner you get to the throttle, the sooner that slope goes positive. So if you can get on the throttle sooner in the corner, then I have more positive slope. We used to also try and explain to drivers like, also, the sooner you get on the throttle, it's like making the straightaway longer. You get to accelerate for a longer period of time. So you get into that, it's like, okay, the number one job of the driver to always think about is what is preventing me from getting on the throttle sooner? So we now start to introduce the scientific method. Too often, everybody jumps to a theory when there's, they haven't even talked about a hypothesis yet. As I okay. Let's just pick up on that because I think that is that in the sense of something's unexpected has happened. And it could be a number of different things. And then lots of different, lots of ideas get thrown in and they're all feasible because it could be that we don't know any different at the moment. So one of the difference that an engineering approach is meant to bring is a bit more of that structure to the, to those, that problem solving, I suppose is the way of doing it. Is it so is that kind of where? Yeah, that's the idea of the scientific method is you have a process and you know, we didn't invent this process. It's been well developed. This wheel was developed a long time ago and it done very well for us here on Earth as humans. But I try and get drivers to understand that we're going to start with an observation. And what was that observation? I can't get to the throttle when I want to. And the next thing in that observation is why? Now tell me it's understeering or tell me it's oversteering. But too many drivers come in and say, it's, it's understeering. It's like, yeah, but we're the fastest car here by three seconds. So I can live with that. Is it will the tire leave it? It's not broken. Don't fix it. So we then can start to develop our hypothesis. All right. I can't get to the throttle soon because it's understeering. And I believe it's understeering because my restoring moment and whatever you want to do. That's when the engineer steps in and says, yeah. okay, we go back to like you mentioned before, is it stability or move maneuverability and start trying to dissect it that way. But it's always about what is preventing you from getting on the throttle sooner. Well, so, so just to pick up on that, right? So hold that thought, because I would come back to where you come. But a lot of the conversation that we have with drivers is, is not about that. 
So it's about this phase of corner entry, of breaking. Uh, we're obsessed with breaking points. So it's corner entry, trail breaking in. And what you're saying is, in actual fact, the priority, whilst all of that stuff is, I'm sure we'll come on to it in a minute, is important, the, the actual success criteria or more is, is in terms of how early you can get back onto wide open throttle or how early you can get back on the throttle at all is, is almost more important than anything else. You mentioned the fundamentals, and to me, that's the number one fundamental. The thing is that there are too many assumptions, and everybody assumes that you're always trying to do that, but nobody ever came out and said, your number one priority is try to get under the throttle sooner. No one ever says that. Everyone just talks about brakes and trail braking and, you know, how, how you modulate the throttle and, you know, when you come off and then you're steering, you're lying and all that sort of stuff. And it's just like, all of that, like you say, it's implied, but no one says it. Also, that helps you order things because late braking and roll speed, all this stuff is important. But the simplest thing is, if you're the last one to get on the throttle, everybody's already started accelerating, and you have to have a much greater positive slope to try and catch up. So the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit is get to the throttle as soon as possible. Also, if you happen to mess up, that's a real easy recovery because at the same time, we have to manage risk. What is more risky? Getting on the throttle sooner and maybe dropping a wheel off or something? Or bonsaiing the corner and no way saving it and going off the end? So it also comes back to risk management. And my thing is always, that's what will take that line and move it up. The second thing on how you can move that line up is your minimum speed or what we call roll speed. I'm always on the radio. Holler at the driver, roll speed, roll speed. You hear me click on roll speed. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so that's because um, you've, you've rolled the car into the corner and you're trying to keep yeah. speed up. Is that, is that right? That's a kind of little spot right between when you're no longer braking and you aren't clear back to wide open throttle. We try and bring up the concept of maintenance throttle. It's more of something you would do in a sweeper or on an oval track. Road courses, circuits, a corner may not have enough delta, to enough you know, degree change in direction. So it might be that there is really no steady state. It just might be transient in, transient out. But any corner that's long enough that you do have a steady state in there, now there's that little gap in there where you're no longer braking, but you're not really wide open throttle. That's when you're just rolling the car through there. And... That's where we try and get the idea of maintenance throttle and trying to roll a little more speed. Because when you go back and look at your speed trace, if you look at those valleys, if you can carry a little more minimum speed within the valleys higher, that also took you know, your posi slope and moved it further up. We say up the intercept, you know, it's further up the scale. And that's our object, make more area under that line. So... Now it starts to get into being this funny little balance. Okay, now we need to start talking about entry, braking, break on, break off. I'm a strong advocate of it's not just where you hit the brakes, it's where you release the brakes. How would you, what's your tip for doing that? So this, so we're getting into the bit now, this is the driver's kind of obsession really is, it, in fairness, it's their biggest contribution to the corner is this kind of braking phase because it, you're coming from the end of the straight and then at some point, they've got to come off the throttle onto the brake. They've got to brake in a certain way. They've got to turn the steering wheel. They've got to get to the point where they're back on wide open throttle again. So there's this event, and that's the, the highest skill bit, really. I mean, that's the most thing they have to do other than shift gears. So I, I can under, I mean, I've said about it earlier, I can understand why everyone's so obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. So what's your tip for dealing with that bit? Because a lot of people think, right, okay, I'm braking at 200 board. Okay, let me throw in just a tiny little sidebar here, a little tangent. That's where I look at the, the coaching part of it. And there's many different aspects of coaching. I look at it as four major areas. And one of that is ability. And ability is going to have subcategories. And one of them is task mastery. You have to master these tasks. Because just like you said, other than shifting, that's where you've really got these activities you have to take care of. And those are down to what I like to categorize as car control. We have car control and we have racecraft. Racecraft is a whole other area, but car control is this bit where you have to do all of your activities. 
Now, in the old days, you know, you just have to try and watch a driver and tell him do this, do that. And there's so many driver coaches these days that were professional race car drivers and they're retired. And they look at something and they say, well, you got to do this, you got to do that. But that's really not what you can do if you have data. If you have data, the whole world just opened up to you. What kind of data would you recommend for people? Because not everyone listening is maybe that comfortable with the numbers. And even if they do have the data or they have bought a logger or they've got something on their phone, even they're, they're not really the, the speed trace, maybe they've got a handle on, but from then on, it's a case of now, what do you mean by that? Is it important to instrument my car with a minimum amount of things or can I get away with basic thing? Or I mean, what, what, what would you recommend? And now you need a little more than just your phone. Okay. But there are some very affordable systems right now. If you just have a, a good basic logger, hopefully you've got GPS so you can do your, your, in essence, your beacon, because trust me, the old days when you used to have to do an infrared beacon, it was a pain. We always had to mess with the sun and you say, oh God, we forgot to set up the beacon or whoops, turn around, go back to track. I forgot the beacon. Um, forget, you forget, you leave the beacon on the pit wall, don't you? It's just walk yeah. off. <laughs> or, or, or you forget when you're at a different track and, you've, and your sensor's pointing in the wrong way because of the last right. left. That was the other side, driver left, driver right. So just a, a basic system with a GPS and then just to add some driver controls. If you add brake is, is the biggest one during, okay, for the driver, Brake would be your first thing. And you can get by with just a single brake pressure sensor. Next is a steering sensor because as the engineer, I want the steering because from that, with these data systems, we're going to discover the infinite possibilities of math channels. And this is where we can take the information from one sensor and just, you know, stick it into algorithms and just simple math equations. We can develop more and more. So if you would, to, if you were to give me just a basic system that had the GPS, steering, throttle, and brake, I could probably come up over 200 math channels. And then <clears throat> if you wanted to spend a little more money and you got four suspension sensors, now immediately we're well over 300 math channels, probably approaching 350 math channels. So you don't have to have a very elaborate system. I'm willing to bet and US dollars for probably $3,000, probably, you could get a pretty amazing system that will carry you on for the rest of your racing. You're really right as well, because and then that's evolved so much and, and it, just, it just gets more affordable for people. If people was freaking out of the 3,000, then you can get a lot of stuff from something like, I don't know, one of the cheaper ones, which don't have external channels, which just with your lateral longitudinal acceleration is another <laughs> thing, which is often a pseudo steering and braking as well. But if you did have them, look at what are these, what kind of things do you look at? Well, I do this for all drivers because I have them set up in, a, in my, my different systems. So it doesn't matter if it's a club racer or a professional racer, my math channels are all turned on. Because I keep telling people, you got to at least give me a steering brake and a throttle. Cool. Because with that, we can really do things. But what I do is I have my driver channels and then my car channels. And getting back to these driver tasks that need to be completed, I have math channels so that when you go into the corner, I'm going to measure exactly when you get on the brakes. So I know the distance down to the foot where you applied the brake. And then because I'm measuring brake pressure, I also see where you release the brake. So now I know to the foot where you release the brake. And because we have throttle, we know where you are on the track when you got back to wide open throttle. So now you can look at those real quickly on, on your data. And I can say, well, looky here. First off, we're going to try and master these tasks. And one of them is your brake on. This is part of your car control. And when I work with professional drivers, Say, okay, the goal is I want you to apply the brake inside a one meter window, whether it's three feet. Yep. I'm giving you the length of the front wheel. I want you to be on the brake every single time at that same point. And then to make it a little more difficult, I want you to figure out how to release the brake at that at a given point within one meter. I get you that three foot window. And then likewise, we're going to get back to, okay, see when you did this, 
Then we have another map channel that is measuring the minimum speed in the corner. So we don't have to try and look at the squiggly lines and say, well, is that the bottom of the valley? Is that the bottom of the valley? It immediately just comes up as a single value. Our next goal is, I want you to hit your minimum speed within a half a mile an hour every time. So part of that is it really becomes very simple when you break it down this way, because I don't know ahead of time what the magic spot is. That's why it's called testing. And we have a little thing. It's like, okay, we're going to pick a corner. You're going to take the two board or whatever, but we're going to focus on this corner and maybe another corner over there. And let's run five laps. And the first time, break a car length before the board. The next time, half a car length before the board. Third time, hit the board, half a car passed, whole car passed. And then let's see what happens to your brake release point and what the resultant minimum speed is in the corner. So that's how we just break it down and start trying to find where's that sweet spot on the track. Okay. So, yeah, so perhaps having structure when you go to a test like that, I think will be interesting for people to hear about because I, I'm not sure everyone does that. I think if Grafton, there's fairness, there's so much admin. If you're taking yourself to the track with your car and you go, there's so much admin and kit. It's a kit sport, isn't it, motorsport? You've got <laughs> equipment, you've got to make sure the things are running and warmed up and the tires are, you know, on and the, and the wheels are... So, and, then, and then all of a sudden it's, oh my God, put my lid on and, I, and I, I'm going to drive around and then my session started, I better go. So people, I, I, I quite often I hear people that they just they end up just basically just driving around without much of a conscious plan, enjoying it, but then <laughs> out of it and then go, it's actually, if I, maybe there's a better, maybe there's another way of doing that. Is that what the pros would do? And you are saying, no, that's not. We would have maybe a little bit more of a, structure to it so we're going to focus on a couple of places and just and work quite methodically on definite things you're, but you're doing it not only for the driver but you're also doing it from the data point of view so you're, da you're gathering information so that you can actually assess like is this better than you know, is, is what you're doing here better or, or, or what you're doing there better is that kind of what you're yes and the, the thing is that some very interesting things will happen there are times when you use this method and the driver thinks, oh, I can go way deeper than this. Oh, I can go way faster than that. Because all too often, and especially more in the, the, the amateurs and the club type stuff is people will confuse activity for speed. And what happens is you're going down a straightaway and the real estate is flying past you and you're going in and you're going in deep, I'm deep, I'm really deep. Oh my God, it brings it clear off the scale. It's like, all right, now you hit the brakes as hard as you can. Maybe you're a little over threshold braking and it's starting to get a little wiggly on the way in and then you manage to catch it and then slam down and throttle. But what happened was, is you went in deeper and when we go back and look at the speed trace, you still have to come down to that speed correction to make the corner. And now your negative slope gets steeper because you're coming down to that minimum speed in a shorter distance. But the trick is that when it gets too steep, you can't control where you end up and you overshoot your minimum speed. Where if you back up the corner, we say. People use that term of over slow. Well, that, that, that will happen. You over slow it because you came in too hard. Right. You went in too deep and you can't control the deceleration. You're decelerating so fast, you can't stop decelerating. That's like a double negative there. And you, and you just drive the speed deeper into the valley, where if you come in a little easier, you can you know, have a little higher valley. Now, the opposite can happen as well. Oftentimes, I see in the, uh, the vintage cars, they don't have the brake capacity to go that deep that the new brakes do. Yeah. And in that case, sometimes actually going in deeper helps. But that's why we have the data. We're going to try and find that sweet spot. Okay, braking here gets us, nets us a higher minimum speed. And then tell me what, why you can't. Why can't? Because it's going to get loose going in. Or I can't because it wants to lock the fronts. And now as the engineer, okay, I can fix that. That's a machine. I, I can fix that. But I have to work with you, the pilot, to try and operate this system at a higher efficiency. So it really gets down to trying to manage those points, those skills. It's your brake application, your brake release, your minimum speed, 
you know, how soon you can get back to the throttle. And then with the pros, I take it another step. And now we not only just look at the spot where you applied the brake and where you released the brake, we're going to look at the signature in between. I'm going to look at that. Do you mean, by signature, do you mean the, 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 the profile or how you're going from full brakes, as it were, to no brakes? Is that like how smooth or not smooth? There are several things there. I, mean, I do have a brake aggression a math channel that I use okay. that looks at how aggressively the brake was applied. But also, I'm looking at the brake pressure between on and off. So not just that length or that amplitude, the, what was the peak pressure, but let's get back to, here we go, I'm an engineer, area under the curve. <laughs> <laughs> so you're just taking the integral of the brake pressure to figure out that area. And you can start really working on what happens in that. But then that's getting down to the really fine pro level stuff. This is your top indie car. This is F1 kind of stuff. You know, but it's all on how you change the attitude of the car. We always talk about the cars on a point and how do we manage our weight distribution during braking. All too often, what happens in, in the semi-pros, amateurs, club racers, is the driver will come in and say, oh yeah, down in Canada corner, this thing is, is just so loose, it oversteers so bad. It's all I can do to keep it on the tarmac. I go in and look at the data and say, yeah, that's what you reported because that was the biggest event that ticked the box in your memory. But you forgot that you were braking way too soon. You finished braking too soon. Now you turned in, All right? So what happens? I brake too soon. I release the brake. So the weight has come off the nose. I start to turn. There's no weight on the nose. So it starts to understeer. What do I do? The natural tendency is to put more wheel in it. Now you start to scrub off some speed. Suddenly the front hooks up again with all that steering angle in it. And the back snaps around. You only remember the last thing. It's like, oh my God, it jumped out. But when you look at the data, you come back and say, oh, this is easy. This was a mistimed corner. Try breaking deeper. Now you can't always convince a driver to do that because maybe they've had a, what we call a, an agrarian experience in that corner. They went off out in the weeds. Okay. A moment. I would call it a moment. Yeah. So they give that a little more space. Yeah. I, I say it's like a little kid that walks to school and the dog runs out and bites him. The next day they walk down the other side of the street. Yeah. As drivers, we do that. Have you ever been able to work with a driver and overcome that? That's for a uh, Hawthorne effect will work. Darn it, it's a good thing I'm, I'm retiring and I don't have all these drivers listening to me now. There have been a lot of times when there was no change. We told them what they wanted to hear, and so they drove it differently. Suddenly, it handled better. Yeah, this, that, has, that, that happens, doesn't it? That does happen. But I would not recommend that for anybody except at the pro level Agreed. because that's that there's a lot of risk involved with that. That's where you have to start really understanding sports psychology and working with all these different psychological effects, trying to get drivers to employ a little more psychological skill training without maybe realizing it. Yeah. But a lot of times I'll say, okay, I think I can fix the problem. I'm going to give it a couple of tweaks and maybe I'll give it a click on the shock here or there and say, okay, but you have to help the car too. So try instead of breaking at this, Break here, and you should feel it because I, I made the adjustment. And they'll come back and say, oh, yes, that was much better. I'm thinking, yeah, because you weren't breaking too soon. <laughs> but then was, the question for you at that point is, do you then tell them that you didn't change anything, or do you... No. And so this is, this is the tricky thing. It's like, when you go off down that route, at a professional level, it's different to maybe more of the amateur environment where that kind of trust is quite, you know, is important in, in, in a way to believe that belief. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because it seems to work. And like several people say, oh, I've done this. I never changed the car. I told them I did. And they went quick. And they were well, happy. It's, it's the Hawthorne effect. I went back to the baseline uh, yeah. and you went faster. Yeah. Okay. My job as the engineer is to try and get more productivity out of the system. And if we close the loop and we come back there, that's why I prefer to work with drivers that have no knowledge of cars. Oh, okay. And that way, it's just we're a team. I trust you, you're going to trust me, and you tell me what you need, I'm going to give it to you. Um, but in turn, please try and do what I ask you to do. Get back to throttle sooner. <laughs> yeah, but that's it, isn't it? That's the message, isn't it, from today? I think if nothing else, it's just like, that, 
no one talks about it and I'm really glad you brought that one up because it is it's so obvious when you hear it but then if you've not heard it articulated you may not have thought it yeah because I drive but I understand the engineering too and I've said before on the show that sometimes I can be I, I I don't leave my engineer brain in the pits I still drive it it's still with me in the car and it I can be over a bit over analytical about how I'm driving and it slows me down and then quite often if I can just if I can get rid of that and just go just drive as Ross says you drive stupid just go out and drive the thing then and enjoy it and and come back but please remember what was the car doing not how to fix it but just what was it doing the part of that might be just your personal system with all drivers i use a a debrief process okay where as soon as you come in before anybody talks to you you need to take the debrief sheet and and i've developed these debrief sheets where you go and self debrief in silence with no input love that what's on your sheet is it a map track map or is it uh um okay mine has a, a map at the top with the corners all numbered and then below that i have little sections for each corner right. the numbers coming down and that way you can draw on the map if necessary yeah. so you can put an arrow or whatever and then in the uh, different corners we have four or five different lines so we have break on break off and then also like use a numbering system and you can put a number across the little box or a number so you can do like a U1 or a U5, under through one, under through yeah, five. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then you have your entry, middle, exit and you can put your number on the little case yeah. for the little box for entry and you can do your U1 or O2, whatever, but you put it in the box kind of relative to where you were on the track. Love that. Yeah. So that way you're also capturing your line on paper. So there, there is this, it's, it's a little complex at, at the very first blush, but once you get the hang of it, it's, oh, and what you're doing in essence is a mental dump and you need to do it as soon as you get out of the car. I've also done a lot of study on memory and the thing is when your epinephrine level is high, you know, our adrenaline, we're all adrenaline junkies. That's why we race. That's when you have the best memory. 30 minutes from now, when you cool, you will not have the same memory of what happened. And that's when I started making drivers do their debrief sheet in pen rather than pencil. Because the thing is, while you're doing your self-debrief, I'm going to be downloading the car. And then when you're done, I should have the car downloaded and we're going to sit down together shoulder to shoulder. And you're going to go down the sheet with me and explain everything. Because this also is helping your imagery. You observed it. You recalled it as soon as it happened. And now you're going to go over it again. And we're helping build that better mental image. Ross Bentley is a good proponent on this, and I agree with him 100%. And how do you build this mental imagery? But the other beauty of this is there's a byproduct. Once you start doing all these debrief sheets, you can put them into a notebook, and now you're going to be more like a pro. Have you ever noticed that at a club event, somebody will show up, and at the end of the weekend, they're finally back to their personal best? Have you ever noticed when the pros unload, they might need three or four laps and they're within two or three tenths of their best. And then they spend the rest of the weekend trying to push the envelope a little further. They don't talk about it. And I've worked with teams where we've had a shredder in the hauler. <laughs> Nothing went in the trash. Nothing goes in the trash because you have your personal notebook. That way, before you even come back to the track, you can do your mental imagery at home and look through your notes, close your eyes, get the stopwatch, run those laps, see if the stopwatch matches the lap time. That way, when you unload, you're not back saying, okay, I'm feeling pretty good here. I've got to get the rest knocked off. You already know, okay, this is the first time out, the tires are cold, so I'm not going to hit the two board. I'm going to give myself about two car lengths until the tires warm up and the track gets cleaned you're off. You're starting, you're starting, you're already where you left off from last time almost and you know, where you're going. And I've, I've, I've had that before with a, with a few drivers who've been on and they say, yeah, you might not think of it, but 
one of the things that I've always been really hot on is taking notes and uh, I've got everyone in my team to do that as well. And they didn't like it at first. And then, but what we're trying to do is build up that, they, they used the word database, which was quite nice for a racing driver to say that. And they're building up the personal database of what worked, what didn't, Did I took a bit of curve, it didn't work. This time, yeah, definitely cut this corner, you know, break it later than you think. Yeah, building this in a language that means something to them so that they can come next time. It's just come back. And also when they're switching cars, so some of them are switching to, between different cars or a car they don't drive very often. So like, how is it in that car? And if they do come back to it, they can go back to those notes and go, oh, this car, I've got to drive it in this way at this track or, or even not at this track. You know, this car has this characteristic and I can then apply that somewhere else. Exactly. And then you take your notebook, your database, and yeah. you start applying it back to your data acquisition where you're looking at your braking then where you're applying the brake and releasing the brake. And you really start to move up the chart because oftentimes you'll get out on a plateau you think oh gosh i'm two seconds off the pole what's going on i I need to buy that new whizzy bit that's it he's got it and i don't but in reality it all comes back to driving because as i mentioned before if you confuse activity for speed you'll always be trying to chase activity because very often drivers will report that this doesn't feel fast and we show them on the data in the stopwatch, you just said in your new personal best by two seconds. Now yeah. what? And it's, sometimes it's hard to convince them that what doesn't feel fast in the seat might be faster on the stopwatch. And that's, that is a, a thing with the numbers. So for me, people know some AI does the data and stuff like that, but for, I only got into it because it's a means to an end and engineering, well, it's, it's all a means to an end. And what really surprised me sometimes is that when you're driving and you go through a corner and you think, well, I didn't feel fast. And you look, you do look at the numbers later and go, actually, that was quicker. And you're like, oh, that's completely counterintuitive to my assessment of that corner approach would have been. Sometimes I've made a mistake. Like I've literally made a mistake, gone for a corner, gone, oh, that was rubbish because I felt slow. <laughs> and uh, it's been quicker and that doesn't work in my head. And, and it's one of those things of why bother with data? Why use all this stuff? It's a question I get quite a lot. Even even today, and it's just, the goal isn't to be quick on the laptop. It's to help you as a driver have a better idea in your head of what's going to work around the lap in this car. That's it. And and what the data does is it a it remembers stuff better than you do, and it also gives you that certainty of that works and this didn't work. If you're doing it like you're saying in a kind of scientific approach way, as it were, like you you, you create some experiments in your driving. Well, I'm going to try this a wider line here, I'm going to try a tighter line here and and just see. And then we'll go and look at it and go, yep, that worked or that didn't work. And sometimes you have to do some things that are totally counterintuitive. Yeah. We all get too wound up in segment times and looking at that eclectic or that theoretical, where actually there are some times that we say, okay, I'm purposely going to throw away that segment. Yeah. I know I'm going to lose two tenths on that segment because if I do that, when I come through the switchback, whatever, I can gain four tenths or five tenths in the next segment because it's not just that one spot it's not that i felt more g-force in the car so i had to be going faster it's time yeah. and it's, it's that cumulative time and it's not that one lap wonder it's all of them added together is what makes the race well and, and just to build on that a little bit more it's it's about you don't re- you don't need the data i mean people were racing before yeah and if you do enough laps you will get there eventually but no one's got enough time <laughs> for all of that. So what can we do to shortcut that period of time? So you've already said the pro drivers are rocking up at the track and they're on it straight away because they prepared from last time. And so what can we do every single time to, to make sure that tomorrow's track day or tomorrow's track event or this you know, the next event that we do is we're getting more value from it because we're, we're quicker sooner. And it's the data can help you from last time, the, the, your records can help you from last time. And therefore you've, that's why it's worth all the admin of mucking about with this stuff because you're going to be quicker than you would be if you didn't bother. Uh, it's, it's just doing your homework. And even if you don't have data, in the old days, we didn't have data. I had clipboards and they were packed full because I was taking notes <laughs> on everything. We used to have the stopwatches with the splits so I could stand in one spot so I'd catch them on the start and be, then I'd turn my head this way and catch them down there. So I was trying to just manually capture segments. We've all gotten spoiled with you know, technology and we forget what we did in the old days. There's some old tricks that you can still apply to the new technology. So, yeah. so go, on, go on then, so it's a, cause I'm just, I'm looking at the time. I've been mean, chatting away here and it's, it's so lovely. I don't even see the time. 
But I'm thinking, well, if we could sum up with what would be like your, what would be those trips or maybe one or two of those things that you think actually, I don't, now these days we're spoiled because we've got, it's so easy to either get lap times, sector times, but before that we never, we used to do this and that would still be relevant. So maybe just sum up one or two things just to leave us with that. That would be amazing. Never give up the stopwatch. If at all possible, try and have somebody go to the track with you, your spouse, your buddy, whatever, and always have somebody do lap times because the data doesn't always work. Sometimes you don't have data. And even if you don't have data, the stopwatch still works. And try and remember as much as you can and immediately come back and write it all down and then start looking at on lap three, I did this. Yeah, but lap three was the slowest. So just try and do more of a structured approach and not just go down there and talk with all your mates and say, oh, you know, we're having a good time. And because like I said, to me, racing is a religion and racing done proper is harder than any job you'll ever have. There's a lot to it. Uh, that's a good point. And, and it's one of the things I, you know, I get people like yourself on the show who've, who've been at the highest level and they've seen a lot. And so the idea really is just to introduce people to the ideas, uh, the different approaches that they could take. But again, they've got to remember that, well, it's our hobby and, and we may, if, if at any point this stuff becomes unfun, it makes your hobby unfun, then just stop doing it. Just go back to the fun stuff. But if there's a little fire inside of you going, actually, those, I do feel as if I could get those two seconds. If that guy's beating me and I don't think he's better than me or whatever, and this is a way of, of doing it. And sometimes it's the most unlike spaces that you'll find the time. Well, and the greatest single takeaway I could give to everybody is something that I tell my drivers every time, just as they're rolling off the grid, race the track, not the other cars. Don't take more than the track will give you. Anytime I've had a driver get in an accident, get in a bad wreck or even get hurt, it's they got wound up and were racing the other cars, not the track. You're doing something that when you step back and you think about it, it's like, well, that was stupid. Why did I do that? There's no way the car could have made the corner, you know, because I did that. Or there's no way I could have stopped. So if you race the track, we get back to those fundamentals. Where am I wide open throttle? Where do I apply the brake? Where do I release the brake? Back to risk management. You're going to be out there. You're going to be safe. You're going to have fun. So you know, race the track, not the other cars. I love that. What a wonderful way to to wrap up. Look, it's been fascinating. I could actually just sit and talk to you for hours. Um, honestly, I, thank you so much. If, if people want to reach you online, I know you, you're, you're in the middle of transitioning from what you have done in the past to some new things. So where can people find you? And uh, have you got a presence online? And what, what would that be? <laughs> I have a, a website, just auto-where.com, auto-where.com. Um, that's my, my main business that I'm working off of there. And then if uh, you'd like to send me an email, it's john at auto-where.com. Awesome. So you can catch me either way. I'll put some I'll put some links in the description below. But yeah, look, thank you so much. It was my honor and, and a pleasure to, to speak with you. Genuinely could have talked with John all day. And in fact, after the show, we did end up chatting for another hour or so. One absolute honor. And I really hope you've picked up several good ideas for things to try and ways to approach your own motorsport. The standout things for me were the focus on getting on the throttle sooner and the session debrief approach of downloading your thoughts and feelings before you've spoken to anyone. Simple things that will really make a difference to your track time and your enjoyment. You may know that at the end of season one, I wrote the Motorsports Playbook, a summary distilling the first 20 shows into nuggets of wisdom. I made the notes so that you don't have to. If you've not got it yet, go and grab yourself a copy from the website. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and visit us at yourdatadriven.com.